Hello, my name is Terry Newman and I am delighted to be here with you today to present the latest installment of the WJC webinar series. The World Jewish Congress is the international organization that represents Jewish communities in over a hundred countries throughout the world. And the Jewish Diplomatic Corps is the flagship program of President Ronald Lauder that mobilizes young Jewish leaders throughout the world on issues of importance to the Jewish world and the State of Israel. This webinar is part of a series of lectures and seminars that we provide for you, our watchers and listeners, online on, concern, on issues of concern to the Jewish world. I personally am a member of the WJC Diplomatic Corps and I'm happy to present to you today our guest speaker, Lieutenant Colonel Peter Lerner, the former IDF spokesman to the international media. Peter, like myself, is a former Brit who made Aliyah, albeit at the age of 12, to uh, the third Zion, just outside of Jerusalem. And he has made it to the rank of Lieutenant Colonel and uh, the IDF uh, leading spokesman to the international media. Um, Peter, we're delighted to have you with us. It's a pleasure to be here. So, um, I'd firstly like to uh, remind all of our, our watchers and listeners out there that this is an interactive webinar. So as we are going, please feel free to send your questions in. We have a dedicated team here who are uh, looking over them and will be passing them to us in the course of, in the course of this. So, Peter, you have had a, a remarkable career, albeit you're not yet retired. Um, 25 years really at the heart of dealing with Israel's Hasbara, IDF's Hasbara. Would you like to sort of take a few minutes to share with our, our watchers and listeners what you've done? So the scope of my career, the 25 years, has encompassed probably the, the majority of um, substantial incidents and issues that Israel has faced throughout uh, the 90s. So when I joined the military, and it, it was the height of the, the Oslo Accords. Um, one of my first missions, one of the first activities I had to do was actually uh, a press conference uh, with transfer of authorities and, uh, to the Palestinian um, Authority from the Israeli military to the Palestinian Authority. So it was working in the early 90s together with uh, the Palestinian leadership, with the international community in transferring authorities from Israel to the Palestinians. And, and that was my first experience of gathering a press conference, trying to manage the media, uh, I had everybody in the room from CNN to, um, uh, I don't know, El Arabiya, and all different types of news organizations, the Arabic speakers, the English speakers, French, German, everybody in the room, of course Israelis, and trying to manage that um, so that they could get the image of what Israel is trying to do um, and conveying with the Palestinians at that time. So the jolly Oslo's days, as we call them now, is a reality that I was perhaps the uh, the very beginning of my, my military career, and specifically in the field of media relations. Um, but I had, throughout my career, uh, worked with uh, the media on one hand, um, but also with the international community, with international organizations, United Nations, the International Committee of the Red Cross, uh, and indeed, the, what the, my job was a as a liaison officer was to make sure they could get their job done without impeding on the military's job. So there was a main interlocutor in enabling them to give humanitarian aid, a main interlocutor to help them carry out development projects, you know, build you know, water lines or, or electricity power, power stations, um, uh, all different types of civilian projects that enabled the, uh, um, uh, the international community and develop uh, the area, specifically the, the West Bank, Judea and Samaria, and that was in uh, a, a very you know, optimistic period in time. And then, of course, I went through periods such as uh, Operation Defensive Shield 2002, uh, a, a junior officer, but very in the midst of things at that time, uh, a liaison officer to uh, the international organizations. I facilitated the entrance of the International Committee of the Red Cross to Janine um, in, during that operation. And what they did was actually verify Israel's stand that there was no massacre 
on the ground. So definitely in the midst of things. Um, and, and throughout the years I've served on the, in the Gaza Strip, uh, facilitating again with the international community, and probably for the last eight years or nine years on the forefront of media relations, um, first as the spokesperson of uh, uh, the Central Command, so everything to do with um, Judea and Samaria, the Jordan Valley, everything that falls under the scope of the Central Command, and, um, and finally, in the last four years, and which I think is the highlight of my military career, the lead spokesperson for the international media on behalf of the IDF spokesperson. Um, that was uh, 25 years, and I think all of the time I saw myself as a bridge. Um, and it didn't really matter who I was dealing with, whether I was dealing with the domestic media, the Israeli media, uh, the foreign, the international media, the Arabic-speaking media, um, or international organization. I always felt that it was my job to bridge the differences because I believe, and I think this is a life philosophy of mine, that when you get people in the room face-to-face, uh, -face, there's an ability to come to mutual understandings um, and, and the messages that are conveyed need to be understood. And if they can be understood, then that's the way to do it. So my life philosophy as such is be that bridge between Israel and the outside world. Wow. Well, that's a really uh, summarizing 25 years in uh, two and a half minutes. <laughs> um, so you say that the, the highlight of your career was in the last four, four years when you've been um, spokesperson to the, to the international media. Is, you know, a lot's happened here in the last four years. Is there any specific event that you can you know, put your finger on, a specific campaign or you know, the, the whole world of media? If you've been in it for 25 years, when you started there wasn't such thing as Facebook, there wasn't such thing as Twitter. The that, that whole world has gone through a revolution on a similar level to the printing press. Um, what would you say has been the, the highlight, of, if the four, last four years of the highlight, what is the highlight of the highlight? So I, I think about this a lot, definitely since I've left the position. It's been one of the, you know, the, the, the thinking spots and, and one of those issues that I'm trying to put my finger on. But definitely I, I would say there are two categories in the success of the mission. I would say, first of all, it's the people I served with, the people I led, the people I managed. I had a staff of around 50 people, uh, very talented, very creative, you know, always challenging my uh, leadership, my thought process, and making me a better spokesperson. So people helping me uh, craft and design the message that I want to convey to the world. People that I would have this professional exchange of how to prepare better for crisis. So managing those people was a huge um, benefit from my perspective and definitely a highlight. So in the scope of those four years, I must have had around uh, together about 400 people that had passed under my hands um, I could say my work, my job would have been a lot more difficult with other people. And the second component from a professional, you know, the, the challenge and, and, and the highlight is definitely you know, everything the military prepares for is conflict. And the conflict of my tenure in, in, in those four years was Operation Protective Edge. So we had some 50 days of conflict where I was the lead spokesperson. I was, I, throughout, throughout those 50 days I did something like 400 live interviews um, uh, with world leading press. Uh, I did daily press briefings. Uh, this was, that was from, for me, that was everything I planned for in throughout my entire career. So definitely conflict, crisis, controversy is what I planned for, what I prepared for, and I think that's what I delivered on. So definitely that is where I felt um, uh, the highlight of my career. But of course, each, that, that's 50 days, and I could point to different incidents within those 50 days that would also be highlights, and the challenges that you face. And I think when you are preparing for crisis uh, in a conflict scenario, um, you have to try and foresee, and I think we planned well, we knew what we were going to, the types of challenges we would have on the battlefield. We knew that the reality that the media would reflect would constantly challenge the things that we are trying to convey. And we knew that we had to be there and, um, and be prominent enough so that Peter Lerner becomes a household name. And I think that was the, the, you know, one of the most uh, rewarding things I got. People were writing to me on Facebook saying, we set our clocks by Peter Lerner time on CNN. So for, from my perspective, that was a, a place where I wanted to be. I wanted to be able to, people would listen to me, they would appreciate what I have to say, 
They don't necessarily have to agree with me, but they would have that aha moment where they could say, I didn't think of it that way. Right. Well, certainly, you know, to many of our watchers and listeners here, you are definitely a household name and a, and a, and a hero to, to many of them. Um, you, you, you mentioned earlier, and, and I, uh, I very much uh, agree and identify that your vision is that of a bridge. You believe that if you get different people into the room, you can make things happen. You can make the magic happen by just having them sitting around the table. Now, as you were saying, you, you deal with various different audiences, be it the international media, CNN and, and their watchers, international, organisa uh, international organizations, you mentioned the United Nations, uh, etc. And obviously the domestic media in Israel as well, who uh, even though you're speaking in English, a large portion of the Israeli public also watches English because they want to know what the rest of the world is thinking about Israel. Um, which one of those three uh, audiences uh, was the most challenging and why? So, each have their unique challenges. And I wouldn't point to any, because they're, they're completely different audiences, I could not, you can't really compare. But I can definitely say the domestic, the Israeli media, from an Israeli point of view, is the most important audience that we have. We have to make, we have to instill confidence in the military. In, you know, we are dependent on the young men and women join the military. The, you know, I have a daughter, when she joins the military, I want to know that the military is doing everything to train her well, to feed her well, and giving her the tools so she can, can fulfill her mission, whatever it will be. And that, from my perspective, and, and from an Israeli perspective, is definitely the, uh, it overshadows everything else. The confidence in the military as a, 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 an effective uh, organ that can deliver the goods when required. The international perspective is, is a completely different arena. And it, it, the challenges that I found in the international media was, you know, people have asked me over, over, the, over the years, are the international media anti-Semitic? And I say outright no. Uh, do they come with professional bias? Sometimes yes. Um, are they looking to reinforce preconceived narratives? I would say sometimes yes. They are definitely, and the, the, the international media are here in Israel not to cover Israel. They're here to cover conflict. They use this as a base of operations. It's convenient um, in, 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 in the way that it is close. You know, it's an hour to Gaza from where we are here, here in Tel Aviv, and it's 40 minutes to Kalkivia or um, uh, from, here, from here in Tel Aviv. So it, it's, you know, it's a skip and a hop to cover conflict in this place. Um, so definitely there is a, a, a level of convenience where if I'm talking about trying to embed journalists with military forces, they don't need to embed because they can come and go on the same day. They don't need to go off the way across the world in order to spend days and days to get used to the troops to try and convey a message of what's going on. Um, so in that respect, the international perspective is always going to be one of the adversary using what I call the dead baby strategy. Our adversaries, the Palestinians, have no problem parading dead bodies. Uh, we do not do that. I would say gratefully we are, you know, we invest in life as a state, as a military, uh, the Israel Defense Forces. And that is constantly what I knew I was going to be up against. So that is, I would see, the most difficult task I had in trying to weigh up, weigh up that, that, that strategy. Um, the third audience, the international organizations, what I found working all of those years is you have extremely professional people out to do good. They want to help, they genuinely want to help people. Some of them have political uh, standings, uh, uh, and some of them indeed are anti-Semitic, I would definitely say that, and some of them, but I think the core reason that they are here is that they want to help people that are in dire need. Um, in the room, in a closed door, they might even be on the same page as us. But they have a political standing that they also need to represent an organization, an organization's position, and as such, when they step out of the door, you don't know what they're going to say, or probably you do know what they're going to say, in the press conference about how Israel is treating Palestinians, whether we're doing a good job or not. So when you when you try and balance it out, 
Israeli audience is always going to trump every other audience here because we are dependent on it. The international audience as such is a, an audience where we have to be more proactive, uh, more transparent, more accessible, and open in order to convey our messages in a speedy manner, in a way that will be concise and clear. And the international community, the international organizations, are, you know, they are a mixture of bodies, and, and you know, we use that international organizations as a term, but there are so many different organizations there that you need to really iron out those that you can talk to, those that you might be able to talk to, and those under no circumstances you should talk to. Right, so if we, it's very interesting the way you've taken the three and done a dive. If we just maybe take this moment to, to think strategically, you were in charge of the international side of things, which means mm -hmm. when you were looking at an event and presenting it, what was going through your mind essentially was how do I present this to the international audience? When there were clashes, as you say, you know, and you know, examples I can think of were taking a, a, a blown up bus into into European capitals. Um, how do you explain when, when the, the tension between, on the one hand, we want to be a strong, independent country, and on the other hand, we have to get the message out that these people are not coming with toy guns, you know, and paper aeroplanes. When those two clash, how do you explain to the spokesman who's dealing with domestic media the importance of the international media, and what without, at the same time, upsetting the morale of the, of the home front? So indeed, that is a huge challenge, and that was, I would say, that was one of my jobs, constantly lifting up the red flag, saying this, this type of message is bad, and this type of action is bad. This is how we need to do it so that it can be acceptable for everybody. Um, I, I would say, though, that you know, my job, and because I had, I had part of the puzzle, the military part was mine. You know, the military cannot and must not replace the other organizations of government. So you have the Prime Minister's Office, which is a, a, doing a good job. You have them, the Foreign Ministry, which are doing their job. You have other ministries today, which are complementary actions and activities in, in the field of public diplomacy, Israel's diplomacy, um, and everybody needs to contribute in their way. Now, when I came into the office, I determined five main themes that the IDF needs to do when, when nothing is going on, when there is no crisis. Uh, five main things that we need to be talking about to the media. The first is Israel Defense Force as a defense operation. We don't have no expeditionary capabilities. We are not. We don't go thousands and thousands of miles away. We look at our borders and we look at the, the terrorist threats that we have within our borders, and we operate against those. Uh, when there are threats of thousands of rockets raining down from us by Hezbollah, we need to be able to operate. We need to know where they are hiding these weapons. Uh, if Hamas is tunneling from Gaza into Israel. So that's the, the fundamental line, the theme of the IDF, or is the Israel Defense Force as, as a defense force. The second and third components relate to that, and they talk about the professionalism of the military on one hand, and the moral values of the military on the other, on the other hand, and how you take a young 18-year-old man and give him the responsibility to be in charge of life and death scenarios. And I'm very proud to say that the military is, it excels in that. Sometimes we have mistakes. Absolutely there are mistakes. And definitely there are, those mistakes are the media challenges that I have. But I would say that if you um, take a journalist from a leading newspaper to um, a training facility where we train urban uh, air warfare, and you give the journalist the rifle, which is a, it's a virtual reality scenario, and they, you give them the rifle and they have to shoot the terrorist, and they understand in their, in their own, on, their, on themselves, and then they have to try and reflect that in their reporting. The challenge of fighting in an urban zone, I think that is a success. So those are the two second and third components. The fourth component is the, what I would call the global trend um, you know, issues. So it's green energy, it's um, uh, the, the idea has components of green energy, the way we uh, recycle and, and use energy and uh, use solar panels and all different types of things like that. Uh, Startup nation, anything to do with technology, those, those are the types of things that, are, that could, could fall into that category. And the final component is the diversity of the idea. So that relates to anything with 
um, the men, uh, LGBT friendly, uh, the women that serve and the types of positions that they fill, um, co-ed uh, battalions and how they are confronting Islamic State on the border with Egypt. And, and sometimes, you know, it doesn't have to be one or the other, it can be, they can be interconnected, all of those five categories. Uh, so that you show technology used by a woman on the border with ISIS, you've talked about defense, you've talked about diversity, you've talked about professionalism, and you've talked about uh, uh, startup nation all in one package. And you do stories, we've done sto hundreds and hundreds of stories about that. So when I came in, it was taking those principles, instilling them, and getting a media product out there uh, with the team, um, and indeed, you know, and crossing the entire spectrum of the global media. Uh, we came in and, and we determined that we have to push for something like 2,000 proactive media activities per year. Um, that is, and, and we, we grew every year, so we were you know, trying to reach and constantly trying to improve ourselves and constantly trying to reach that figure. Uh, and that's just in the traditional media, that's just one side of, of, of the story. Today, of course, and as you rightly mentioned, when I joined the army, we didn't have Facebook, we didn't have Twitter. Uh, and today everything is transparent. And I think the, the, the IDF is, as a component of uh, Israel's uh, public uh, abilities, is also very prominent on social media. And uh, we, have, yeah. we have Facebook pages and Twitter, and, and, and all of these uh, channels are, I would say, it, they're intended to reach out to different audiences in different languages and the idea is that they have the ability to circumvent media, the traditional media, inform and challenge those, I would say, anti-Israel or anti-IDF standings. So definitely there's a whole you know, view of when the traditional media and the, the uh, social media work in tandem, they're complementary and uh, one feeds the other. We, you know, we, we are a, if CNN takes our tweets and, and, and posts them, then you know that you are a relevant source of information on your social media channels, and it's spilled over into the traditional media. Right, and so I guess as we're coming into the midpoint of, of this interview, um, I think it's time for the million dollar question. You've, you know, you've spoken about a five-pronged strategy You've spoken about traditional media, you've spoken about the new media, you've spoken about what's happening inside of the IDF spokesman, but also what's happening inside of the Prime Minister's office and other, uh, other organisations. Are we winning? Million dollar question indeed. Um, so, I believe that there is definitely an audience that wants to hear us. I believe that we need to refine the tools we use to reach them. I believe that if I had, um, uh, if there was no limit on resources, I would definitely be investing in social media tools uh, that amplify Israel's message. Um, I would definitely be investing in bringing people here, because when people come to Israel, they see that what they see on the media is only a very small portion, perhaps, of reality here, where you can... Uh, uh, so definitely, I think, we have... You know, during uh, the Gaza conflict in 2014, my parents were in England. And my mother would call me up saying, Peter, what are you doing? You know, the people are out in the streets demonstrating against Israel. And, and, um, and since then, I, in some of my media engagements with some of the leading European media, uh, when I've suggested and pitched stories to them, they've told me, listen, we don't want to do anything between Israel and Palestinians. Give us a story about Hezbollah. Give us a story about the border of Syria. Give us a story about ISIS or Hamas, but we don't want to do anything about the Palestinian arena. It, may, it rubs off wrong within the, in, within the I don't know, French, German, British audiences. So I'd say we have to know that that is the main issue, the Palestinian arena. If there is ability to influence the positive outcome of that, it will always relate to politics. It won't relate, you know, the best spokesperson can only represent the reality. He can't change the reality in, in reflect, and, and reflect something that isn't happening on the ground, which perhaps some of the world leaders or, or, or liberals in, in, in the world would expect. Um, 
world media are constantly trying to latch on to millennials. Millennials want their views um, reinforced. They don't want their, bi their biases exposed. So it's a double-edged sword. I, th I would say that in the way the government operations today work, it's the best it's ever been. More in sync. Understand the messaging. Everybody knows their job at the table. Um, and and my, my experience has seen that grow over the last 25 years in a way that it, that it never existed before. I think the military in the past was always too prominent. Uh, the military has to know when to hold itself back and let the government speak. Um, and, and, the, and just because we are available and sometimes we have languages doesn't mean we need to fill that vacuum. Uh, because otherwise it automatically makes everything militaristic and we don't want to be there. So I would say, yes, we can win. Uh, I would say that we have to believe we can win. And I'd say we have to use the right people and the right tools in order to deliver the goods. And some of those are our language skills, some of those are technology. Uh, and you know, being a startup nation, I'm sure we can find the right tools that will convey the messages in a speedy time. And so I think from any organization's perspective is always going to be the, the biggest challenge. How do you um, beat the time crunch? Something happened, somebody, somebody live tweeted, something happened, or a video which, is, which goes out live as things are happening. How do you respond? How do you take proactive stance against the reality that and developments on the ground? You said we can win, but my question was, are we winning? I think, uh, and, let me, and let me just say, uh, how do you judge if we're winning? Perhaps mm -hmm. let me make the question, maybe I'm asking you a question that's a little bit too tough, because we need to define how, we do, how do you define winning? So when you're analysing this and you're sitting with your team, you know, is it just the amount of times you appear? Is it, you know, when do you give the team a thumbs up, when a thumb like that, and when a thumb down? So I, I would say there are, there are several ways to judge the success of any media campaign. Uh, but I would definitely say, first of all, where are you in the time, the news frame, the, the, the time that is designated for the instance? So I would say, yes, we're winning if we are there. And it's relevant when it's a relevant story. Um, you know, we are facilitated, there is an exchange of fire on the border. Where we, did we, where are we first to, to bring out the story? So definitely, that is a win. Um, now, if you take that story, and it's a story of an exchange of fire on the border with Sinai, who was, and, and how do you do the follow-up stories to that? Okay, you had an exchange. Who was the force? Was it a co-ed battalion? It was, there was a female uh, company commander? Uh, how do you package it in the aftermath so that your message has an extended life? Um, I, would, I would try and, you know, usually in all of the pro Israel circles that, I've, that I meet, they always say that we're failing. And that this is, I think, I would say that generally, that is not my core audience. They will love me and they will hate me no matter what's happening. I need to seek out and touch those that are undecided. Not those that hate me completely, because they're, you know, they're, they're not looking to buy my commodity. Not those that support me blindly, but the people that are undecided that want that I need to touch them. Um, and, and I would say that there is the whole media effort is complementary to the diplomatic effort which the foreign ministry, the prime minister's office, they're carrying out. And there you see lots of activities going on um, where Israel is sought after, where Israeli technology is sought after. So I would say if only public sentiment doesn't reflect or doesn't develop into anti-Israel activity on a global man manner or on uh, the diplomatic levels, then I would say definitely there is a contribution there. Is it empiric? I don't know. I don't know. Is, is there, is, can we manage it? I'm not certain. Uh, but I definitely feel that you know, if you don't play the game, you're going to lose. Yeah, the sense is often it's a, a, a downward escalator where you, know, you have to run up faster than it's going down. I, and I, I don't agree with that. I think we are running up and it's going up. I think that, that you know, Israel has improved over the years in the ways it communicates. 
we are prominent, we are there. Now you have to understand, are there people willing to listen? Is this story already about two old men that won't shake hands, or is it a story about a young boy throwing a rock at a tank? And then you have to try and see the frame where you can fit in there and try and influence it. So I would say, yes, we can win. Yes, we have little wins. And certainly, of course, because it's not a, it's not a uh, clear-cut victory, because are there clear-cut victories in the types of conflicts we face? Uh, asymmetrical warfare is not only on the battlefield, it's also on the media battleground. And that media ba battleground means that you know, we have to make sure that the images that we're interested in get out, they're in relevant places, and they support our strategic messaging. So when I would gather my team around the table, and I give them tasks, the German media, I would say, do this. To the French media, I would say, do this. To the, to the British media, I would say, do this. To the global international media, the BBCs, the CNNs, the, the Fox News of the world, I would say, do this. And to the Arabic media, I would say, do this. And social media complements all of that in all the different languages at the same time. I would say, yes, it's part of the mosaic of the Israeli advocacy capabilities. Does it work in tandem? Again, I think that today we're much more successful than, than we've ever been. We have to seek out those that are willing and want to listen to us. We have to reach out to those that are not our traditional audiences, those that, 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 that the Israeli supporters, the supporters, the, the blind supporters, and seek out those that aren't our haters, because you can't really engage with them. They're not really interested in anything you have to say. So, uh, I mean, uh, a lot of our, our viewers here um, are obviously interested in reaching the same um, target audience as, as you've defined, not those who will love us regardless or hate us regardless, but those who are undecided. Have you done any sort of research as to what percentage of the potential audience that is? Is that a, you know, are there any? So there have been, there have been several studies about this, both from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and, different, and other different organizations and, and uh, private practices. Um, uh, roughly what they say is on each side of, on, on the, of the spectrum, so it's a very pro-Israel, it's around 15%. On the very pro-Palestinian, it's around 20%. And the middle right. is, is, yeah, that's a huge, and that's why I would say, let's talk about LGBT friendly in the IDF. Let's talk about minorities. Let's talk about startup nation, because you want to draw them in with things that interest them, that they're not necessarily interested in Israel, because otherwise they would be either here or there. And that, that, is, that is the job. So definitely there's a huge opportunity there to find things which are interesting to a huge amount of people, whether it's historical, whether it's technological, whether it's just you know, value-based, um, or just you know, people that want to have fun on a beach, which is also good. So let's take it LGBT issues, as you've just raised. As you're aware, in the United States, where many of our, our watchers are, are currently uh, tuning in, that's become an issue recently in the, in the US Army. Um, what, you know, if, what are the relationships on a, a spokesperson level between the spokesperson of the Israeli army and the spokesperson of the American army? Is there that same level of uh, transfer of information that there is at the intelligence level, at the development of weapons level? Uh, you know, do, those, do you have those sort of crossovers with your counterparts in other Western armies? Absolutely. I, uh, I work closely with uh, colleagues in the US military. Um, both at the level of uh, chief of staff, both at the level of uh, U.S. Uh, European command, uh, because those, that's the main point of reference for for Israel. So definitely, we have a working relationship, uh, professional discussions. I visited Germany and met and met with my colleagues from the Bundeswehr. I met with the British military as well. So definitely, there is an interest in how to be effective on media battlefield as well, not just on. So definitely an exchange of information, always interesting to see how things evolve. Um, most of, most of the, uh, those militaries that I've had engagements with has always been in, a, uh, in relation to how do you do that so well? That's the type of question that I've been received. Um, but, but usually it's because though the military components that I've come into action with, they do not have the same type of reality that we face. Their challenges are how do you recruit more people to the military services and different types of things like that, or 
So that, that's where you know, they look up, look at us, and I've been in conferences where um, uh, 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 social media uh, commander in, in one of the militaries picked up his hand and said, Sir, I want to say, uh, I have a picture of the IDF Facebook page in front of my team, and I tell my team every day, that is what we need to be like. So, but, and when I tell them that, that, that the marvel of being, um, of leading such talented people, they ask, what is the secret? And I say, the young people. We have to give them the sense of ability, the tools to deliver, and room to make mistakes. So, I was, you know, I was gifted, I said in the beginning, the, 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 the uh, few hundred people that have come through my desk in the last, uh, uh, over the last four years, were the people that challenged me most, that gave me mo the, the most pride in what we were doing, because it all, all was motivated on reflecting the military as it really is, in a way that people can accept and understand. So we've spoken about 25 years of successes. Um, were there any failures? And if so, would you choose one which really sticks out to you and what you did and what now, in 25, you know, looking back, you would have done perhaps in a, a different manner? Well, I, when I talk about, um, there were things that I, that I wasn't necessarily involved with, in, but I, so I can't really attribute those to, to me. Uh, in, in those, 25 years, I would say that th those that the, the failures would probably be around uh, people I'd let down in the professional working relationship, um, and not necessarily in how it was reflected. Because sometimes when you're in the midst of a crisis, then you have the tendency to be a bulldozer, and you can knock people down and step over their head and get into the midst of a crisis and, and make people feel irrelevant. So I think the failures of my failures, I think, were around that um, type of person-to-person -person relationship. Because you know, what matters most is what's happening during that crisis. And if people get in your way, then, there, then, then there's a problem. But, but that, that usually is, is, is the challenge. Um, other things, though, that, that I could say is um, yeah, the, the reality that we, that, that we try to uh, understand as developments go on the ground is how do you get the information quicker to the journalist? And every time, every time we've had a, like a failure, it's because the information wasn't clear, it wasn't accessible enough to me, uh, or to, to the IDF spokesperson as a unit. Um, but definitely we were able to, to try and, I would say, make the gap smaller over, over time. Uh, but that is always going to be the Achilles heel of any big organization dealing in a media uh, driven, social media driven reality. So the IDF often uh, puts itself forward as the most moral army in the world. Um, can armies be moral? And if they can be moral, what, what does that mean? And how does that message come across? Because you know the idea of course itself the Israeli Defence Forces. But many people in the world see it differently. Now your job has been to try and present it as the idea. But so how do you do that and what does it mean to be a moral army? So I would not use that term uh I would not use that term at all. Uh, I don't think it's uh, it because people will always say you're not, and then you have to prove. I think we have to be professional. I think we have to have a uh, moral um, uh, 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 the, the ethics of the idea need to be clear, and we need to be able to reflect those in the types of activities that we are doing. And even when we fail, we need to be able to say this was a failure of the moral values that the IDF upholds. And you know, I've had numerous occasions like this, the story of El Azaria, where the military's position was that this was a failure. Um, uh, was, was an instance where, you know, and it set the entire country up against 
how the military was conveying and saying we did not believe that what this soldier did was right. So definitely uh, we need to highlight how we view our moral standards, how we implement them and how we instill them in the young troops that, are, uh, that join our ranks. Um, and of course the mistakes and so highlight by our response to those mistakes how we see those. So I would say it's a mixture, that's what you need to show how you try to minimize. How there is no other military in the world that phones up its enemies saying, we're going to bomb this location because the commander calls it. Most of the time, the things that we do. There's no other, you know, we send text messages, we send, we drop leaflets, we make you know, radio announcements, all of these types of things in order to safeguard human life, even when it puts our own troops at risk. So if you are, um, if, you, if you understand that, that there is a, a risk for, uh, for your own troops, and you, you, you're balancing basically your own troops' lives in that morality that you are trying to, so you need to be able to show that. And definitely that's something we've, been, we've shown, we've shared and, 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 uh, across you know, multiple platforms. It does not change the fact that when you're in conflict, people die and death is tragic no matter where. Um, you've um mentioned as well the importance of mill millennials. When, when we're thinking about the future of uh, Hasbara for the IDF, um, are, are we at a stage now where Facebook and Twitter are the 1980s and they're in effect flares and now it's all about Instagram and Snapchat and you know, where, where is it going? When you, if we were, if you're now thinking 2037, um, what does it look like? What does it smell like? I definitely say technology is taking over the mainstream media. I would say definitely we need to be able to be a relevant source of information where people will find more and more interest in what we're saying, how we're saying it, and we need to utilize all of the tools at hand. So we were the first military to be on Snapchat uh, because we understood that that's the place to be. Um, and we also saw the, the, a drop off of people leaving Snapchat when Instagram took made Instagram stories. So we. You know, evolved and went to Instagram stories. So it's knowing and, and learning where the next thing is going to be. And I think the, you know, the IDF has traditionally been groundbreaking in social media. We had the first YouTube channels, we had first Twitter, we had first Facebook. We, you know, we have, you know, uh, even The Guardian gave us you know, uh, good, good points on being groundbreaking uh, for the social media activities. That, um, that we do and, and what we did. And, and, and I think that is, again, it, it all rolls back to the people factor. Because it was easy for me. You know, I have new recruits that, they, that, that joined me every few months. And when they came in, I used to ask them, where are you? When you're trying to get news or information or interest, things that interest you, what are you looking at? And it was always Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, Snapchat, Ynet, uh, CNN, or, or BBC, whatever. And, 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 and in that, yeah. okay. So in effect, you, you see it that the focus will be on the new media, whatever new is in 2030. But that's the that's the medium. In terms of the message, do you see a change in the message? Do you, is the message of Israel 2037 going to be a similar message to Israel 2017? No. Or in, how will it'll the be message? More, it'll be more people forward. It will be a you know, big presenters, people that are relatable, people that can, you know, people that can tell a story, uh, good storytellers, people that are able to have you know, a conversation and communicate directly with um, in a way that is acceptable and you will choose the languages or you know, not even language because you'll have Google Translate or some sort of automatic translation so you could be communicating into different languages to, across the globe and, and telling your, the Israel story or the IDF story at a given time, specifically in crisis, in order to empower those people with information that they're interested in. What you will see is people who aren't interested in, they will not see you at all. Uh, and then you'll have to decide who are, who, are the, who are the core audiences and how to actually reach those that aren't interested if you want to touch them anyway. Right. And that's going, to be, that's going to be the challenge in the future. So our, um, our, our viewers are sending in lots of questions here which are being passed to me. Uh, I'm going to start with, uh, with this question, which is coming from a, a university student uh, in the United States. Um, they, they have asked, um, on their campus, uh, 
the, uh, where there's a lot of tension between pro-Israelis and pro-Palestinians. The Palestinian argument is always put across on the side of we want justice, and the Israeli side is always put across as we want security. How on a campus can security ever come before justice? So, you know, Israel uh, historically has always been on the side of justice. And one does not negate the other. But in order for Israel to exist, we need, a, a, we need security. And the justice needs to be served, and it needs to be delivered. And I definitely believe that there is a, a huge student body that needs to be mobilized. They need to be able to talk about it. They need to be well informed, and they need to be confident that Israel is a just nation. Um, you know, the way we see things here is, and it doesn't matter where you stand politically, we want to have peace with our neighbors. We don't know how that peace will be. Let's talk about it when it's relevant. Relevance will come through secure, security. And that's where we need to be. That's, you know, that is the mutual stand. That's the mutual standing. You know, I sat in the room with uh, uh, you know, the country directors of international organizations. And that was the position that I always put forward, because they would always say, what about justice? And I said, no, there, there will be that time for settlement. Not settlement, settlement of the issue. And that time will be when Israel is confident that it can exist in a reality where the security threats are uh, addressed by everybody. And the other side needs to acknowledge that they are legitimate security threats. Right. So, in effect, your message to uh, our, our listener is when they face such a situation like that, is to say Israel is not just interested in security whilst the Palestinians in justice, rather Israel is interested in security and justice, and the only way to get to justice is through security. Absolutely. I understand. Okay. And um, on the, the issues of um, uh, BDS, which is an issue... Uh, you know, boycott, divest sanctions, which is really growing in steam uh, throughout much of the Western world. Um, how, you know, what, what's your advice? What's your advice to those people on the front line who are trying to do your job in effect on a day-to-day -day basis, but without the whole network? And you, you had 50 people working under you, and these people are working alone. And uh, they, you know, they go onto the internet to, to get information. But what's your advice to them? How, what information can you give them to help them with their tasks? So first of all, there is a. I want to compliment the WJC. I think they're doing a fantastic job in making a network and and connecting people and giving tools to convey those types of the types of message. I think it's the independent responsibility of people who are involved in the, in this type of thing to keep themselves informed because information and knowledge is power. And knowing the, the, the core issues is the basis of any good argument. Now, even if at the end of the day we agree to disagree, now I have my position about this. Um, BDS is wrong, it undermines two-state solution, whatever. It, it does not bring us closer to any sort of, sort of solution, and it, it has you know, hidden motives anyway. And, and, and that is probably the, the, the fundamental argument against it. And when we're talking about con combating that, I definitely say engage. Speak to these people. Tell them that we're not against, we are for. You are against. You are against Israel. You are against the existence of Israel. You are against the existence of the Israeli, the Jewish state of Israel. And that is where they're coming from. And we need to be powerful enough. We need to be passionate enough. We need to believe that, indeed, the reality on the ground is a challenging one. And I, you know, when I visited, when I visited campuses, when I visited friends overseas, when, this is always this is something I'm always asked: be in the field, play at this. Do not shy away. Do not, you know, feel, learn, study, have answers, get informed. There is an abundance of information from official information to, you know, to you know, know their talking points as well, know where they're coming from, and then have that argument. And you know you don't have to agree. You don't have to. You know, but BDS is wrong. And from my perspective, if you choose not to be on that playing ground and you shy away from it, then that is where they will win. And we need to be upfront. We need to be able to talk, talk about it, and we need to be able to engage those that propagate it. 
Um, another um, listener has asked about the issue of the missing soldiers. Because the missing soldiers is such a strong propaganda issue for the domestic front, so to speak, it means that the spokespeople are actually appalling the game. Now, um, because how you present it affects the morale of the people here, which affects them the pressure on the political uh, echelons as to how they act through the through the military. So it's a kind of circle. What is what is a, what do you see as in your opinion the, the role of the spokes of the spokesperson's unit in dealing with the issue of missing soldiers? Well, well, the IDF uh, when there is no conflict taking place in a situation where there are uh, bodies or, uh, uh, or or civilians being held by Hamas, for instance. Uh, the IDF is not a player on this on this issue at all. It's left to the government. The government needs to be clear and concise on their message uh, and how they ma maneuver it. So definitely, it's a challenge. But I would say that within the Israeli society today, that reality does not necessarily dictate the day-to-day -day agenda, and a lot of what's happening happens um, below, below the radar, as to say. So it's not that uh, a driving force today. It's an important task. It's you know it's, a, it's something you know, uh, uh, that we have to operate and work in order to bring back uh, the bodies of our soldiers and and, re and return of civilians. Uh, but today it does not necessarily dictate, and while the other side perhaps trying to manipulate it in a way, if we address it publicly, constantly, frequently, then we're falling into their hands. And I would say we need to be very calculated in what we actually say. I think it needs to be a very short and concise message that we are obligated, determined, and we will bring them back. Okay, that's very clear. Um, Today, many of our listeners feel that the um, the line between anti-Semitism and anti-Israel is becoming more and more blurred. Um, what is? You know, how do you see that? You know, is this something? You know, many of the you, the answers you've given, you've said that's not an issue for an IDF spokesperson. That's an issue for the Prime Minister spokesman. Do you see that issue of rising anti-Semitism mixing with anti-Israel propaganda as an issue for an IDF spokesman to be dealing with, or is that sort of off? Uh... So it's it's not really something that I would fall into into the military's category because, as I said, throughout my service, it was and definitely in the last four years, I've definitely tried to restrict myself in talking on issues that are beyond what the military is doing and how it is doing. It. So this relates to that type of issue. I can say for a fact that I've been exposed to myself on social media to anti-Semitism and very, uh, in, in, uh, in, you know, in a way that is um, hurtful and, and spiteful. But that's, I think that comes from being prominent and, and you know, very in, in, in the midst of things and, and being on the public agenda. And those were the types of things that I, I chose not to address because of because of my position. I think when, uh, as a Jew, as an Israeli, I think there is no way to separate the two. I think if you are against me uh, as an Israeli, then, or, uh, then, then effectively you're against me as a Jew. And that, from, from my perspective, it, it's intertwined. And that is where we need to, you know, we need to highlight uh, when people are calling out anti-Zionism and say, you're not just against the state of Israel, you're against what the state of Israel is there for the Jews. So, uh, many of our listeners, as you said, uh, uh, set their clocks according to Peter Lerner time on, on CNN. Mm -hmm. In effect, you for them were, were, you were the number one spokesman in the world. When, when Peter Lerner looks at the world and he sees different spokesmen out there, who is Peter Lerner's number one spokesman in the world? Well, I think I, I'll take that question and say there was a time where people were sending me photographs of Sean Spicer saying, "Is this your twin brother?" Um, uh, I think I, it, when I look at the, my profession, I look at the people doing it, and I say, "This is somebody I don't envy, but that's the job I would like to do." Um, so I definitely think and, uh, that P 
people that are in the midst are on, on, on this battleground media background and they put themselves forward their family takes a price they take a personal price because you have to be completely invested in it so I can't say that there is one person that I look at and say um, that is my example of who I want to be but I would say that's somebody I don't envy but I'd like to be in his shoes I think that for me is you know that's a way that you you try and, and, and influence and, and try and take what you get what you've done and try and take that and, and, and make it a sub, substantial impact. Um, yeah, it's an interesting interesting job. I have no idea what I'm going to do next, which is which is also interesting. <laughs> uh, right. Well, our, our time is is uh, coming uh, close to an end. Um, two final questions uh, that we we'd like to finish on. The first is is if you were put in charge now of Israeli Hasbara, what would you do differently? I don't know. I don't necessarily think needs something different needs to be done. I would say definitely needs to be a bigger investment in it financially. It needs to be. We need to be able to get all of the. Uh, and this is the biggest problem. I think. There are so many different views and voices in the Jewish world. How do you get them all in the same room and all to agree on certain subjects? And that's another, another issue that needs to be addressed. I would definitely reach out to uh, and, and utilize the networks that exist in order to reach out to broader audiences um, and definitely take those audiences and empower them so that they can come to Israel, visit Israel, see Israel, and judge for themselves what they believe about Israel. And I think we have to uh, try and bring as many people here to, to the state of Israel so that they can see what a marvelous, fantastic, phenomenal place this is with a vibrant uh, uh, society where we can shout and scream and love and cuddle one another in the same hour. And I think that is what makes us special. That is what makes us um, uh, able to survive the realities of being in the midst of the Middle East. Right. Okay. I think a, a cuddle would certainly uh, be, uh, be uh, appropriate there. So I think as, as a, a final question, to all, uh, in, this is for all of our listeners out there. If you had three pieces of advice to give to people who are on the front line doing what you were doing for 25 years, um, what would those three pieces of advice be? Engage, engage, engage on social media traditional media, they don't like to be pointed out as wrong. Make yourself available to speak to traditional media. You, you have to be able to take proactive stance and, 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 and reach out and touch and not wait for them to call you. Um, and, and, and final is prepare for that day when something bad is going to happen because it's going to happen. Don't wake up in the morning and say this has happened in Israel, what can I do? Have the you know, to-do to list ready on in, in a state of crisis, I'm going to tweet, I'm going to call up my, you know, uh, my elected official and say this, you have to be behind Israel in this, or I'm going to write an op-ed for my, my local newspaper, or I'm going to make a, a put together a, a, a demonstration in the university or college where, and, and, and in support of Israel. And those are the types of things, and who is the, who is the network of people that, that, that will influence that? So I think definitely you need to plan for the rainy days, but constantly be engaging on, on two, two levels, basically, traditional media and social media. So our three takeaways are engage, 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 use traditional and uh, new media and reach out, and three, have a to-do list ready. Be proactive such that when the event happens, we are, we are ready. Yeah. So I hope that, that you know, all of our viewers out there have, been privileged to hear words of wisdom from a man who's been doing this for 25 years and has a whole uh, plethora of uh, CNN followers. Um, I can say that here in the studio has been a pleasure and a, a delight listening to you and I've learned a lot from you, so, so thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, I'd also uh, like uh, this moment to announce that uh, our next webinar will be with Professor Alan Dershowitz on the 16th of November at 11am Eastern Time. So stay tuned and thank you very much.